CEO of Walker Miller Energy Services in Detroit. Walker Miller Energy Services develops and implements energy efficiency solutions for utility, residential, and commercial building owners. Carla's company was recently named one of the 50 fastest growing women-led companies, and she started a nonprofit organization in 2003, the Water Access Volunteer Effort Fund, which provides water bill assistance to low-income Detroit residents. Most of you all know that Detroit is being revitalized from a city that if you said Detroit, the first words you heard were crime or murder rate, to the, the capability that I have right now to talk about sunshine in Detroit. I've been in the energy business for 35 years and champion energy efficiency as the basis for sustainability, renewable energy, and so many other things. Detroit is being revitalized the same way it was built the first time, using materials, processes, and policies that were available in the 1900s. Things are being built right this minute while we're still talking about how are we going to get these practices and sustainable thinking into the economic development and the construction phase. So Detroit, like most other cities, is being revitalized, but not in a way that is going to help and support our communities in the next 50 years or 100 years. Detroit is not being revitalized in a way that would support most of the people who live in Detroit. Detroit is typical of all the revitalization or 99% of what's going on in this country. Now that I've given you the bad news, the good news is that there are some projects in Detroit. There are many grassroots groups in Detroit doing pockets, unfortunately mostly in isolation, but driving sustainability. We used to talk about uh, polarized caps and our responsibility to seven generations. We all did our country and the world a disservice because we didn't talk about how fast climate change was going to affect us. We didn't know, but we didn't talk about that. So even a few years ago, I'm talking about seven generations and the polar bears. Well, what I wasn't talking about is the fact that Ms. Laura's basement has flooded three times in two years after having not ever flooded for the 50 years that she's been in that home. When someone comes to the water department and says, I got a problem, my basement flooded twice, what they don't want to hear is, I hate to tell you, but that's climate change. When we haven't talked about climate change in a way that engages regular people in all this, all this time, now we're saying, oh yeah, yeah, that, that's a climate change. And the bad news is there's nothing we can do about it because we're not prepared and the, the politics and the environment that we've been in did not allow our voices to be heard. So now we're behind the eight ball. Detroit is the picture of resilience. I don't think there is a more resilient city in the United States than Detroit. I invite everyone here not to just come and listen to the story of Detroit, but to engage Detroit and all the other Detroits in this country. When uh, I come to these conferences, I'm enlightened, I'm inspired, I'm so happy to be here. What saddens me is the lack of engagement of more people who are being affected by these important issues. Now, this room is like energy. It's so high in this room. But as we leave this room, 80% of that energy is going to be dissipated as we go into our little villages and get back to work. Most of this is never going to get to the people who need it the most. Uh, what I want to urge each of you to do is to lean out of your regular, your normal, your organic environments. If you really care about this issue, we have to mobilize a much larger, much more diverse, much more inclusive group of people. How many of you all know a person who could benefit from this who's not like you? We are the privileged class. We are privileged to be alarmed about this issue. We have information and knowledge and urgency that most people don't have. So we have to bring them in, not for their benefit, but for our benefits. I wanted to highlight a couple of projects in Detroit and because they encompass all of the issues that we talk about, economic, social, ETE energy, 
decided to build a two megawatt solar array in Detroit in um, a community that was largely disinvested, low income. It's called the uh, Grandvale O'Shea Park community. Now you would think that with all the vacant land there is in Detroit, this would not be a problem because there's an infrastructure investment, it's solar, and it's literally land that hasn't been used for 30 years. There's a community that's been in O'Shea for the last 100 years. And there was a, uh, a community center that had been abandoned for the last two decades. The solar array was going to take, take part of the space from that community center. What we didn't count on, because I was following the solar array, I said, anywhere the solar array lands, I'm going to be a part of it. We're going to make a difference. The problem was that the people in the community saw this as additional disinvestment. You all are taking something that's ours, so what if it's abandoned? We have hopes of getting the money to bring this community center back, hopes of repurposing this land in a way that benefits this community. So much to everyone's surprise, there was an uproar from the community that lasted for months. The privileged class was saying, who wouldn't want a solar array in an area that's 10 acres and is largely abandoned? And the community says, what about what we want? So I'm like in the middle because I am part of that privileged class, praise God. But I also see the opportunity of having a solar array in a community that's been disenfranchised. It's with the mayor's office and a guy named Maurice Potts, who was actually in New Orleans when they were redeveloping Katrina. We developed a pipeline not just to put a solar array in that community, but to say, how can we use a solar array as a catalyst? What are the things that we could do to make a difference in the lives of the people in this community? My company actually has a contract to do energy efficiency upgrades for residential all over DTE's territory. So we devised a plan that says when you apply and for us to give you LED light bulbs and weatherization and pipe wrap, we are going to give you the opportunity for maximum resources, meaning whether they're energy related or not, we're going to do everything we can in every home that we know of that can help you. So when you get a home energy consultation now, you can get weatherization, insulation, you can get a refrigerator, a replacement furnace, a furnace tune-up, depending on the age of your furnace. But you can also, you have a child under five or a pregnant woman in the house, guess what? You can get your windows replaced. Not because of energy money, but because of the lead money. If you have a child of a certain age, you can get a free car seat. Detroit has a 0% home loan program. A Detroit resident can actually get a home loan to rectify some of the infrastructure problems in their home. But right now, there's no requirement for those upgrades to be anything other than to coal. So they don't have to be particularly efficient. But if you introduce energy into that and educate the person in that home to make sure that the person who's doing the drywall does insulation, and the person who's doing the basement does waterproofing, you increase the value of the property, but you also increase the amount of money that that consumer gets to keep in his pocket. So you're changing the home economy. We are intentional about making a difference in the lives of people in Detroit. We're so enamored with bringing entities from outside of our city and our state into the city. But our city is going to be rebuilt based on what we do for the people who held on, who kept Detroit from sinking farther than it did, for the fighters, for the people who have really been literally to hell, many of whom have not even seen the fruits of a revitalization. By many other revitalizations right now, it's focused in downtown and midtown. The mayor and Maurice Cox, they have the foresight developing something called 20 minute neighborhoods, which where every major neighborhood that's sustainable, you should be able to walk to eat, walk to get your clothes dry clean, or bike, walk or bike within 20 minutes. I'm talking about a city that has a food desert, a city that has a services desert. So that will be life changing. Other than just really begging you all, to bring other people into this most important conversation of our time. 
make yourselves uncomfortable. If we really want to mobilize people, we have to respect each other enough to learn the vocabularies of other people. Every business, every industry, every job has its own vocabulary. Every group of people has a vocabulary. And it takes some effort to learn. Politically correct is an offensive term to me at this point because it, it suggests that being disrespectful is the right way to go. Just as we have to learn the vocabularies in every other environment, we need to learn the vocabularies of people that we want to include and that we need to include. So I pray that we will that be uncomfortable, lean out. If this issue is as important as we say it is, take the risk and make it a more inclusive and thereby a more powerful movement that we have. Thank you. Our own Cullen Nama is the Director of Sustainable Enterprise at the Oberlin Project. Cullen leads the Sustainable Economic Initiatives to drive smart growth in and around Oberlin, Ohio. Before coming to Oberlin, Cullen worked with the Charleston Area Alliance, a regional economic development entity whose goal is to rechart the course of West Virginia's economy. For commentary is Anthony Flacavento from Appalachia, who is an organic farmer and sustainable economic consultant. He has a book called Building a Healthy Economy from the Bottom Up. So please welcome this fabulous slate. I'm in Appalachia, I'm in the southwestern part of Virginia. I farm, I've been doing basically community economic development work for over 30 years now, and I also do it around the country. And in terms of really appreciate your ending about language, one thing I find certainly with rural people, but as I begin to work in urban areas, uh, Harlem, the Portugal Food Project and other things, one of the differences I find is that rural people and working people relate to the ecosystem as livelihood. Now we don't all in rural areas still derive our livelihood from the ecosystem, but that's still the frame. So whether you're farming or logging or it's fisheries or pulling coal or gas out of the ground, the sense of the ecosystem is that's how I derive my livelihood. The environmental movement mostly has grown out of people who don't need the ecosystem directly for their livelihood. We enter into the environment for recreation and spiritual renewal. It's a fundamentally different frame that I think is huge in the language we use and how we break through these differences. I, mean, I was one of the folks working on the transition from tobacco. We had the, the luxury in, in tobacco in that it was sort of a catastrophic end to tobacco. But here's the reality. When we started working with tobacco farmers 20 years ago to find better things for them, we never told them, hey, quit growing that stuff, you're killing people. But we found markets for products that were better for people, better for the community, and better for them. Organic produce, free-range eggs, grass-based meats, etc. We built markets and we built the infrastructure, food hubs, farmers markets, etc., so that they could gain access to it. We had an interesting experience five, seven years ago. PBS Now did a little show on our work with tobacco farmers and also with loggers to get them to do sustainable logging. And they interviewed one of these tobacco farmers who transitioned to organic produce who's quite good at it. And after getting a tour of his farm on PBS Now, David Brancaccio says, so Bob, uh, all this work on organic, has it changed your view of the world? And he said, uh -uh, no, honey, I'm in it strictly for the money. <laughs> Well, some of my colleagues were horrified by that, but I was actually thrilled because what that means is somehow or other we had created a system that a guy who was in it strictly for the money, it worked for him, and he had fundamentally better land stewardship practices, he was more profitable, and he was producing stuff that people needed instead of stuff that was hurting their health. Uh, in terms of coal uh, and fossil fuel, so in our neck of the woods, it's, it's uh, fracked gas and coal, but coal's the dominant one. So I'm a Sierra Club manager. My wife and I have been for years. And Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign is probably a necessary thing. But I can tell you, I just read an article this morning, it was about a thousand words, celebrating the closure of the 200th coal-fired power plant. And probably many in this room would as well. But I can tell you how that goes over in Appalachia is not well. You have a thousand word article that talks about you know, everything from the ecosystem to rightly so, asthma rates, and all those very real things but never once uses the word coal miner or substitutions for coal mine opportunities, you can see very much how it plays into another narrative of elitists who've taken our livelihood from us and what the hell do they offer in return. 
Similarly, there is a power plan that the Obama administration has now that's actually putting some significant money, and if the Republicans would quit obstructing it, more significant money in to coal communities finding the next economy. But that came six years into the Obama administration. What came right out of the gate with the Obama administration was new rules on strip mining that were much needed, new rules on mercury poisoning, and new rules on climate. All of that preceded it, making the perfect case for the right that, again, they're taking from you your livelihood. And only after all the damage was done did the offer of money come down to those folks, those communities, to build something better. I ran for Congress in 2012. I won the Democratic nomination. I got my ass kicked in the general election. But I'll tell you what, I ran on a very progressive platform <coughs> in a very, very red and rural area. I did better in the coal county substantial. I got 39% of the vote overall in my district. I got between 44 and 48% of the vote in the very counties most hard hit by economic decline over the last generation. And it was at the peak of the so-called war on coal. And I think the reason was that I spoke in the language of livelihood and in the language of how what we do as farmers, loggers, or whatnot impacts our neighbors downstream and downwind. And I think if we can find that language, we might be able to open things. Two weeks ago, the International Economic Development Council, so the nation's largest um, economic development organization, met in Cleveland. So the question is, is why aren't they here, right? Why aren't they part of this conversation? Interestingly, we talk about in Appalachia, we talk about here as entrepreneurism and small businesses, really this um, end economic engine. But what we don't recognize is that while there are so many resources in the economic development space to assist small businesses, they're not coaching on the conversations that we had over the past days. They're not thinking about when you design your business model and your business plan, what are those ecosystem service valuations that we should be considering? This is instead of trying to reframe these bargains and these big corporations. And this conversation has not trickled down into a larger economic development community. I did a paper for the Able Foundation in Baltimore about six months ago why we should think of B corporations, not, which are, stands for beneficial corporations, and it's one of the metrics for looking at corporate social responsibility, but why we should think of that not just as a do-good activity, but actually B corporations are economic development. Because when you unpack many of the criteria for this, for example, pay higher wages, get more money spent in your community. If you purchase more of your inputs locally, you are nurturing your local economic multiplier. If you are reducing purchases of electricity and water because of greater efficiency, you're actually not only reducing environmental stresses, but improving your value as a tourist place and actually lowering the prices of electricity and water for everyone else. It's like we need to take each of these social responsibility issues and figure out the economic nexus that appeals to the grassroots who are hurting so badly. Cooperative extension based out of the land grants is not a, uh, a perfect institution, but I'll tell you today, compared to where they were 20, 25 years ago, they've come a long way. When we started into the work we were doing around sustainable agriculture, uh, they weren't just skeptical, they were completely dismissive. And now most states, although cooperative extension has been whittled down, but most states have a fairly serious uh, presence of staff who understand a little bit about sustainable production practices, about the infrastructure needed to bring local food to market. It's, it's a sea change from what it was 20 years ago. It hasn't happened yet in the economic development infrastructure, but you could imagine something similar taking place within local and county economic development, the regional uh, planning and development districts, the curriculum of uh, economics departments and colleges. That change has happened belatedly and insufficiently, but it's happened within the ag support establishment. It desperately needs to happen in the economic development establishment. You go in uh, almost any state or any city and you look at economic development, they focus on the infrastructure first. When you go to infrastructure, you're going to the municipalities and you're going to the utilities. So the fact that the entrance to much economic development is the utilities and the municipalities means that it's going to be harder to disrupt that, that connection. There have to be mechanisms in place that puts this conversation 
there because it's not normal, it's not naturally there. There are other forms of infrastructure that we're not thinking about in a usual way. So for one example, which of, well, I know there's a market opportunity, right? I know there's a supply side and a demand side, but right now there's a gap in that infrastructure. And we can think about this as a warehouse to connect supply and demand, but we need doers, right? We need practitioners on the ground rolling up their sleeves saying, okay, I'm going to create a food hub to create that market to help transition into new economy skills and jobs. How do we address these new types of infrastructure that's outside our normal lens of economic development. I have some current experience with that. We're buying a, a horse stable, the Mounted Police Division building from the city of Detroit, and we're developing it as a net zero building. Then I'm, I am intentional about using Detroit contractors first, then Michigan. Well, the pool of Detroit contractors who know anything about very refri refrigerated systems, <laughs> or you know, storm water uh, remediation policies is very small. So I have this group of contractors that I literally have to beg to go and look at this system, right? No, I want to use this. What about geothermal? No, I want to use VRL. So for everything that we're trying to do that's different from what some of these people have done for decades, it's a, it's a personal and isolated struggle. And there's no place that I can go to say, hey, we need to bring these contractors and business owners up to speed on building for the next 100 years, not the last 100 years. But there definitely is a gap. Part of an answer is in creative use of municipal bonds. The problem is when you're talking about national bonds or World Bank bonds or however you want to think of it, the nexus between the giver and the recipient is really remote. And it's hard to get enthusiastic about that. But if you can bring it down to the local level, so you know you are investing in the vital infrastructure in your community or your region, it's a whole different smoke. There's a new website called Neighborly. I encourage you to look at it. It works with small and medium-sized towns to help them to create very carefully targeted bond issues and then to market those bonds at local residents to reinvest in, say, stormwater management or energy efficiency or the building of schools. And what's great about bonds generally is, of course, you know, you get favorable tax treatment, low interest rates, but we can really use this as kind of a great model for public-private partnerships. Probably a lot of you in this room know this group, Push Buffalo. If you don't check them out, amazing, I think, combination of rebuilding uh, the physical infrastructure, much like Detroit, take on uh, simultaneously poverty, poor housing, joblessness, and environmental issues. Great group. Even for me, I try to think, and it seems to kind of work in our part of the world at least, to think of infrastructure as basically community capital. We don't exactly call it that, but in so many words. You know, certainly food hubs are that. Another one, we did a vertically integrated uh, forest products business where we had loggers, instead of clear cutting or high grading, they were following a very, very uh, strict set of environmental stewardship practices. We were paying them 30% more for the logs, uh, usually the lower species, and then through a series of capital that we built, uh, turning that into hardwood flooring that, that was put in homes and schools and libraries and everything else at a modest premium. That kind of capital was spent in one place. It, capitalize uh, a bunch of loggers and other businesses without each one of them having to take out a loan or get a grant. So I kind of like that idea of community capital. I'm sure there must be equivalents in other economic sectors. But Casey Hoy, uh, who's an entomologist at Ohio State, has this great example of how we should really rethink the food system. Oftentimes when we talk about the food system, we think, okay, great, we're just going to shrink the hub and spoke model. But that isn't getting the transformation that we've been talking about. How do we do that? Well, let's use ANTS as an example. Um, next in ANTS, right, they have a central nest and they have different spokes based on the heavier pheromone levels. You go to Argentina and those ANTS actually have a distributed network of nests, so smaller nests and a much more complex distribution route in between. And in Malaysia, they have that same distributed nest network. However, the ANTS um, bodies are optimized to carry the load of a specific nest they're going to. So doesn't that seem like a much higher efficiency in terms of how we should be thinking about our food system? So we need to think out
outside of what we know as normal now. You know, how do you instill that type of thinking to really consciously always ask, why not? I would love to have the answer to that <laughs> because there's a mechanism called PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy. And even though the enabling legislation was passed four years ago, there have been fewer than four funded PACE projects successful in the state. Now, in the city of Detroit, one of the issues is that banks use the um, loan to value, and the property values in Detroit are still so low. You can buy a building for $50,000, but you need to put a half million or a million into it to make it what it needs to be, and it could be a remarkable building. If anyone has ideas on how to resolve that uh, loan to value issue, I think we could just open the door wide, and I would love for my net zero building to be the first case project in Detroit. Shameless self-promotion. <laughs> Thinking big and bold. Thinking of, I'll have to ponder that ant analogy. It's a little uncomfortable for me because a fellow named Vic DeLuca, who used to be with the Jesse Smith Noise Foundation, once told me that uh, when I asked him why our work didn't seem to be getting much headway, he said, well, it's because you're a fucking gnat. One thing that it does make me think of, I guess, is I'll, I'll go back to the work that uh, Dennis Derrick is doing with Corbin Hill Food Project in the South Bronx in Harlem. You know, it's, it's kind of a traditional food hub in some senses, but it's not, because somehow they're managing to elevate income for farmers in the Hudson Valley and some other areas, and at the same time get, get good food into some of the neediest things. Uh, Dennis is talking to some of the biggest churches in the region, which are central to the civic and social and even political life of those communities, both the black and Hispanic churches. When I think about it, it seems like that's part of, it. it's not so much the distribution network, but at least it's some of those nodes, which we don't generally think about when we're trying to figure this out. Yeah, my, I mean, my sense is the biggest gap that we face toward localization is capital. I mean, one of the things you discover when you look at the data in the United States is somewhat more than half of our economy is locally owned business, and yet well less than, I don't know, 20% of our banking capital is going into locally owned business, and almost none of securities capital, which you put away in your pension funds or mutual funds, is going into local business. So we have a terrible capital market failure. And unless we fix that failure, all of us are going to continue over-investing in the things we detest and under-investing in the things we know are necessary. So if we can fix this in our own community, I'm working on a book now on self-directed IRAs and solo 401ks, so you can take tax-deferred money and put it into local business. Those are among, you know, a hundred tools that are out there. As community practitioners, we um, always end with a call to action, right? So I'm hoping that everyone on stage can offer our audience members a call to action. Take your investment portfolio, whatever it is, and move 1% per year into local business. Uh, put yourself in the place of a, a coal mine, if you can. Reach out, lean out, engage. Uh, when you're at your favorite restaurant, your favorite local grocer, ask where your food comes from. I have the unenviable task of uh, introducing a couple of people. The moderator today is Michael Duffy. He's the editor of Time Magazine. We have uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I just want to say something about uh, Arnold and Tom. I've been out of office the same amount of time as Arnold, and I don't have the same face recognition. I'm at that place where they know they know me, but they don't know how, so they're like, did you do the news? I got to serve with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and, and I think prior to that, he was most famous for work he'd done in the entertainment industry, but this guy was an extremely solid, solid governor, and solid on energy and climate. I served as a Republican governor, but if you look at the things that happened in the state of California, they're really altered. It's now the sixth largest economy in the world, but they've altered the course of California on energy and climate, and at the same time, built an economy that's the envy of a lot of places in the world. It was under Arnold Schwarzenegger, and uh, if you think about AB 32, the renewable fuel standard, the list of kinds of legislation that you're able to pass down there is really remarkable. The cool thing about my relationship with Governor Schwarzenegger is I got to see the substance that he was about 
and the passion that he brought to it. You're going to get to hear about that today. Tom Starter, I met after I left office, but I've been um, associated with Tom in a variety of ways since then. He's one of the first board members of a group he started called Advanced Energy Economy to truly try to become the business voice of climate and clean energy policy in America. And in a pretty short time, established Advanced Energy uh, Economy, the Institute, and the 501c6 side of that is very active. Tom became um, aware of and convinced that I'm changed with this real thing early on and, and now has uh, committed his life's efforts really in many respects to this. Um, he's listed here as next gen climate. Tom understands this from the point of urgency and the thing that's on his mind most of the time is how do we win this? And I have such great respect for both these men because they've really devoted their life's efforts uh, to clean energy. 40 minutes, maybe 45. Uh, we're going to rearrange the furniture first. <laughs> months together on the road in 2010, I believe, uh, raising money, campaigning against the ballot initiative in California, which would have rolled back all kinds of things that they had both worked on both going back and then would work on going forward. And I want to just reminisce about it, not only because it was something of a buddy movie, but because uh, it was the beginning of a relationship that you're going to see unfold a little bit today. So take us back up to 2010 when uh, the campaign called No on 23 was underway. Well, first of all, let me just say thank you, Michael being the moderator and being so into the subject of environment. I want to say thank you to Governor Bill Ritter for having been a great partner when we did a lot of our environmental work and it was really a great relationship we had and it's, it's wonderful working with people that are so passionate. And Tom Steyer, who is a great Californian and a really highly successful businessman who also happens to be passionate about our environment and keeping this world clean and healthy. That Ed Helms, great actor who invited me here, <laughs> who was actually responsible for having me here today and uh, wrote me a really wonderful note. So I want to say thank you. Where's Ed? Thank you. Great fan of yours. <laughs> Love your movies. We were very successful in California, even though there were a lot of naysayers that said that it would never happen. But to pass some of the strongest environmental laws in the world, it was very fortunate that there was a Republican governor and a Democratic legislature. So this way the environmentalists felt comfortable that they were covered and the business community was felt comfortable with the ideal situation. To bring everyone, to bring businesses and environmentalists, Democrats and Republicans, for the academic community to make this possible. So we were very proud of that, but we knew that the fight is not over. That now the next thing you have to do is actually execute. One thing to make up goals, you know, say we want to reduce greenhouse gases by 25% by the year 2020, brought it back to the 1990 level basically, and 85% reduction by the year 2050. So that's a great goal, but we have to get there. So with the Israel the Air Resources Board and Mary Nichols, who are appointed, uh, a fantastic woman. <laughs> We worked on the national stage, but did such a great job during the Clinton administration. I brought her to California, and she's now running the resources board. Uh, so we knew that that is an important thing to follow through. But then I also said we're going to get attacked from the outside, because the oil and the coal companies are not going to take this lying down. We know how they operate. So sure enough, when the year comes here, 2010, they were there with millions of dollars trying to take out all of our environmental laws and our progress that we've made. So, of course, I immediately declared to warn them. And they said, we're not going to go and take that, like the Washington politicians, that can be paid off very easily with just a few dollars, and they will do everything that the oil and coal companies want them to do. But we're not going to do that. California is a little different. We're going to push back. There's many people that had influence and were powerful. Secretary George Schultz, great Republican, Tom Steyer, great Democrat, and this is the Jim Cameron, who is the director of Terminator and uh, you know uh, True Lies and Avatar and all those kind of movies. 
who I never knew really what party he belongs to, but it doesn't really matter, but apparently he's a Democrat. Uh, <laughs> but we never talked about politics, we always talked about issues that are important, you know, because I don't get really that involved in, in my Republican or Democrat. I happen to be a Republican, but to me those things are people's issues. It has nothing to do with party, because there is no Democratic air or Republican air. I mean, we all breathe the same air, right? There's no democratic water, Republican water, we all drink the same water. So then let's all work, work together and solve those problems. But anyway, so the oil companies came, spent millions of dollars, and then Tom and Jim Cameron and George Schultz and myself, we went up and down the state, and we raised $31 million. And we spent it on fighting the oil and the coal companies from outside the state. It was specifically oil companies from Texas. They didn't like what we did in California because they knew what happens in California eventually happens nationwide. And so we fought them and we battled them. And the land, when came November, election day, we terminated them. <laughs> Not that we see everything exactly the same way, how we should move forward, and what we should fight for, not fight for, and all those kind of things. But we are marching in the same direction. And I think this is so important, and this is why it's so great to have uh, Tom here, because he is really smart and passionate about this subject. In 2010, during this fight, one of the things that we chose to do differently was what to talk about. So it's a vote. Everybody gets to vote in an off-year election. But what do people actually care about? Do they care about climate change? Do they care about global warming in the year 2100? Or is there something else for us to talk about? And in fact, we knew that if we talk about those things, we're going to lose very quickly. We're certainly going to lose everybody's attention. And so we had a different message. As the governor said, we had a different coalition. So in terms of message, we thought we needed to talk exclusively about health, the health impacts, about clean air, clean water, and jobs right now for Californians. Those are the only things we want to talk about because those are the things people care about local human issues. They care about their families, their communities, and the people they love right now. If it's too long a time frame, if it's something too complex and intellectual, they don't care. So we tried to change the message. We had the great luxury of having a very far-sighted Republican governor who was willing to lead this. And it is true that a bunch of us went up and down the state, but as you can tell from today, when you travel with Governor Schwarzenegger, you may be there, but they're paying attention to him. <laughs> <laughs> and that's actually a good thing. So when that happened, the fact that a Republican governor was pushing for this aggressively and been involved with the original passage of the law, and was standing up for it made a huge difference. But in California, the number one group that cares about environment, climate, clean air, is Latinos. Number two group, African Americans. Number three group, Asian Americans. So we knew when we went around the state, we needed to talk to everybody, that whatever people's images were of what an environmentalist looks like, actually it's a much broader group that it doesn't necessarily fit people's stereotypes of environmentalists. So we had a different message, we had a different audience than people thought, we had a different coalition. We changed the framework from being jobs versus the environment and environmentalists to a much broader message about health and prosperity and everybody pulling together. And that's really the first time that that's happened in a public election where that coalition came together with that message, and I think that that's the future. Tom is absolutely correct. We changed the message. And this happened totally accidentally. Because, you know, environmentalists always talk about the ice melting, <coughs> the polar bear kind of jump over to the next ice thing, and the, <laughs> the sea levels rising, and the bat at the beetle infested trees, and, and people just say, well, what do I care about this? Only coincidentally, when we played all these commercials and spent our money on television against those oil and coal companies, 
We tried to change the numbers so that we eventually can win. But the numbers were always behind. We couldn't catch up. And it looked like in November we're going to lose. And then one of the commercials was placed on television, which was about our children getting affected with asthma and their health in the Central Valley because of pollution. And it was sponsored, I think, by the Heart and Lung Association of America. And all of a sudden, our numbers started changing. And then the end, we won with 62% against the oil and coal companies. And it was because of that one message about health, not about polar bears, not about ice melting, not about rising sea levels, not about climate change. We tried all of those commercials. We tried everything. We had the best ad agency. But nothing worked, but then the health message worked. So we knew then afterwards, we all got together and I says, what does it tell us? It tells us that environmentalists, even though their heart is in the right place, have been communicating largely the wrong way. That we got to talk about what's happening today, not in 2050 or in 2100. That right now, people are affected, they have cancer. There's seven million people dying every year because of pollution-related illnesses. There are seven million, if you think about this for a second, because we're talking about more people that die in car accidents, homicide, suicide, war, ISIS, and all of this combined. So the crazy thing is in the United States, they talk about ISIS is a national security threat. But when they talk about the climate change and about the pollution, they don't call this a national security threat. Isn't it funny? It kills so many more people that ISIS ever could kill. So this is why it is so important that we communicate about what's happening now. It's killing people all over the world. In the United States, over 200,000 people die every year because of pollution-related illnesses. Bill Ritter was mentioning this organization um, that he's involved in, that I'm involved in, called Advanced Energy Economy. And we were doing something with Mayor Bloomberg from New York. And we've done a study to show what the input, the costs were of not reacting to climate. And the person who was presenting the study was showing numbers for 2100. And so Mayor Bloomberg was like, you know, what's going to happen in five years? And the guy's like, you don't understand, Mr. Mayor. You know, let me explain to you about 2100. He's like, no. If you, you can't send me out here to talk about 2100. If you can't give me 10 years at the outside, but five years, there's nothing for me to talk about. Really. Governor, why are you one of the only R's who gets this? Well, I'm not. There's many Republicans that get it. There's many Republicans that are fighting for a clean environment, but then there's many that don't get it. Yeah, so right. But let's not forget, when you look back in history, Teddy Roosevelt was one of the great Republicans that protected and put aside more land than any other president in the history. If you talk about Nixon, who created the EPA in Washington, another Republican, President Reagan created the Air Resources Board in California uh, and negotiated then later on the Montreal uh, Protocol. And there's a, there's a lot of good stuff that Republicans did, a lot of great stuff that Democrats did. But everyone is fighting because they're thinking that it's going to help the economy. Like the core states have governors and, and senators that are Democrats that are fighting with the core. There is uh, Republicans that are fighting because they think it will ruin the economy if we go green. And I told them two days ago when we celebrated in California our 10 year anniversary of AB 32 where we made the commitment to reducing our greenhouse gases. I said, look, we didn't listen to the naysayers. And we have proven them wrong. When the naysayers then said that our economy will go in the toilet and California will fall in the ocean if we go green. As if we proved them wrong, because now when you look at the economy, California's economy is booming. We've been creating more jobs, we have more people move to California, more businesses are opening up there. And when you look at the GDP, the GDP growth last year in America was 2%. And our economy grew in California 4.2%. So more than double of the national average. And the Texas oil companies that we chased back to Texas, their growth was 1.8%. So if you think about it, we have 4.2%, Texas is 1.8%. So it's very clear that when you go green, 
that you actually not only protecting the environment, but you also protect uh, the, the economy and you create actually a better economy because we have now more than 60% of the green tech capital venture coming to California. We are having our solar plants going opening up left and right, the manufacturers of solar panels and green technology, algae-based fuel, car manufacturing. We've never had a car manufacturing plant in California. All of a sudden, Tesla now is producing all these cars there. They inspire other car manufacturers to go green and to have green cars. So, I mean, there's all kinds of great, great green action and economic development and, uh, and benefits in California. So we are proof that if the United States as a whole would do exactly the same thing as we have done in California, just copy us. Don't even have to reinvent the wheel here. <laughs> just copy us. Because California is 40% more energy efficient than the rest of the country. If the rest of the United States would be 40% more energy efficient, we could close 75% of all the coal-fired power plants in the United States. That's an equivalent of taking 180 million cars off the road. So think about that. The United States economy also would then have 4.2% GDP growth rather than 2%. I guarantee you. In California, we probably have 550,000 clean jobs. In the state of Ohio, there are 100,000 clean jobs, which is, on a per capita basis, probably half the rate. But the other thing that's true that in, in Ohio, which has 62% coal generation for electricity, you have 5,000 coal jobs. They're all, people think of Ohio as a heavy coal state because of electricity generation. But in terms of actual jobs, it's literally 5,000 jobs for a state with 11.6 million people. So when you think about either jobs or growth, we have an image in our head that we're tied to this old economy. But moving to the new economy means more jobs and faster growth. And actually, Republicans get this. If you look at the polls of Republican voters, they're all over this. Absolutely. And I think you're absolutely right. And by the way, since we are in Ohio, I mean, the reality of this is John Casey, who is a great, great governor. I think, I mean, you can make up your own mind what he is, but I mean, in my mind, he's a great governor because he's in the middle of this. And he actually just came out and said, if anyone tries to tamper with the environmental goals that have been set in Ohio, he will veto any bill. So he made it very clear to the Republican legislator that don't even tamper with that. We're going to keep our environmental goals the way we have set them, and no one is going to tamper with that. So there are Republicans that are having sense and that are marching in the right direction. But like you said earlier, there's some of them that don't. And uh, the key thing is just that we just keep communicating the right way. So let's put the question around it and look a little bit at the tribal politics on the Democratic side. Because sometimes the Democrats can get a little dug in in their own way. Now, I think if I were going to kind of diagnose the problem as a political reporter, I would say the Democratic problem on, on uh, climate is that they sometimes are a little resistant to compromise. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you actually look at where I live in California, where Governor Schwarzenegger lives. Probably one of the best experiences I've had in my life actually was in 2010, no one 23. And the reason that I liked it was I felt like we were addressing a critical issue and everybody was pulling on the oar together. Like, it wasn't just Governor Schwarzenegger who was Republican. The woman who was running for governor as a Republican that year was also no on 23. Jerry Brown, who was running as the Democrat, was no on 23. We had more than half the chambers of commerce in the state of California no on 23. They thought it was good for business. They thought it was the right thing to do. We had organized labor on our side. We may disagree about the best way to solve problems, but we actually agreed on the problem, and all we were trying to do was come up with the best solution. And that is the American way. It's not like we have to agree on how to solve it. Americans love to yell at each other and fight it out. That's our system. But if you respect the other person and accept the problem itself, then coming up with the best solution to the problem between two people who have the best interests of the state or the country at heart is a process that is absolutely helpful and healthy 
and comes up with a better idea probably than either of them had to start with. I don't want to compromise on accepting the facts. The biggest battle that I had to move forward environmentally was not just the business community, a lot of times trying to hold you back, or Republicans, but it was environmentalists. If you try to build, I mean, they, they, they say we have to go green. We have to have more renewables. Then you say, okay, good. Let's go and do it. Let's build some solar panels out in the desert. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> not so fast. <laughs> it's not really not so fast. I want to go really fast. <laughs> Action movies, and I want to be the action guy. That's my style. Right? <laughs> I said, let's move. They said, well, we have a first study. Study what? I said, we have the desert down in Palm Springs. I said, there's no one around. I said, let's put some big solar plants there. They said, no, there is uh, some tortoises crawling around. <laughs> so now they're doing a study for years on the tortoises and their behavior. So that holds you up right there. Then they go and then they discover some sheep. <laughs> and he's moving around in some other area that has to be maybe placed over 50 miles this way. Or well, God forbid. So now you can't build there on that side either. So I have seen them holding up projects more than the business community or anyone else. Environmentalists that want to have environmentally sound energy that doesn't allow it to build great Renewable energy. Built from the time I became governor in 2003, I wanted to build a green power line, the Sunrise Power Line. Why? Because we had the solar plants and the wind in the desert, but we didn't have a transmission line taking it into town. So it's like, imagine you have nothing. If you, you can have the biggest solar plant in the world, but if you don't have a transmission line to bring the energy in, you have nothing. It's like having the greatest movie in the world, but you have no distributor. <laughs> well, it's bogus. Or the greatest product, but no one can sell it. So there we were hanging for seven years, almost eight years, for me to build a green power line that only brings renewable energy. Because there was a gravesite of the Native Americans, and then there was a park site, and God forbid, don't touch this area here because this is environmentally very dangerous. And they held me up, and they held me up, they held me up. Finally, when Jerry Brown became governor, a year after I went out, out of office, we finally got it all done. Eight years later, we got the sunrise power. Why couldn't we just build it in one year? So the environmentalists don't only have a problem by holding you up with your projects, but they have a major problem with their communication. Luckily, the heart is in the right place, but there's a lot of changes that they have to think about in order to move this whole agenda forward and for us to really speed up the process and to get going with our renewables. Only because I fought and fought and fought and I never give up. That's why we are now at almost 30% of renewables. And by the year 2020, we will hit 48% with hydro. That means almost 50% of renewables in California. But you have to fight and fight and fight for those kind of things. Within five to ten years, California will be the first truly sustainable economy, energy-wise, not just in this country, but in some ways in the world, thanks in part to these two guys. So I want to ask you both, what do you each see as the next pivot points? What are the hurdles? What are the things you're, you're keeping an eye on as you make that progress? Having a clean economy from an energy standpoint is clean up your electricity generation to electrify everything, and the third is to be more energy efficient, to use less energy itself. In California now, when we get to this point of having really high percentages of renewable electricity generation, the question is then we move to transportation. If petroleum, car, that's going to be our, the biggest cause of greenhouse gas emissions. I think there are at least 11 local transportation propositions on the ballot in California this year. We are moving in a big way as a state, assuming these paths, to having much more local train lines, local bus lines, local subways. So if you think about Los Angeles, California as the city that's built around the car, they want to do $90 billion of subways. You know, when you think about the future, it's going to happen in ways that you don't expect. And one of the big issues for us 
from a greenhouse gas standpoint is going to be housing. Because if you think about California, and you think about built around the car, it just keeps moving out from the city center. But actually, I think people in California are also on the ballot this year are probably at least six low-income housing measures to let people, working people, live near city centers, which has been a big problem because city centers have gotten really expensive. Enough electricity generation, electrify everything, and be much more energy efficient. It's going to really permeate the way our cities are set up, we move around, the way we live. We're going to have a clean economy that's going to be sustainable, and it's also going to be cleaner air, more fun, and we're going to be richer. So I, I look at this future and I think we need to actually give people that picture. If Governor Schwarzenegger were the governor going around the state, one of the things he would do really well is to explain what that would look like. Like, that's where we're going and this is how we're going to live together. You're absolutely right, Tom, uh, because you ask about the economy in the future. And all of the stuff that you just said creates great jobs. The future is in green technology and in green energy. And you don't want to be caught like in the 20s, the guy that was selling horses and buggies. And then all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, the truck's already on the road. I'm a little bit behind. Or the guy that is investing and still selling the, the video business, and Netflix is already booming. We have seen in California the car industry is booming, the biofuel industry is booming, the solar industry is booming. California and most of the capital ventures coming out of California. And this is why we have such great GDP growth. And this is why now we just became literally three days ago, instead of the sixth largest economy, the fifth largest yeah. economy in the, in the world. And yeah, we are now ahead of England. Ten times more jobs are being created in the green sector than in any other sector. I said this can happen nationwide. I think we should give some credit to the military because the Pentagon has given, given a directive to them to hit certain environmental goals. And I've just come from Camp Erfjan uh, over in Kuwait, which is the biggest military base in the Middle East. And I went there to, to film our documentary series, The Years of Living Dangerously which you, of course, are a big investor in and a, a producer also of the show. And I really, really appreciate that to have you on board on that. But we, we did this one-hour program about how the military is going green. In order for them to operate, they have to have fuel. So the fuel convoys are the most dangerous missions. 40% of all the men and women that get killed in Iraq and Afghanistan get killed on the fuel convoys. So I go over there now and I jump in a big one of those big trucks and I go on this convoy with those guys to check it out in the middle of the desert. It's all in the film. And the, I realized that how vulnerable they are to get hit. And so the military said, look, if we make our military base green, and now of course all the lights and everything is green and there's their own solar, the GPS systems and the radio operation, everything is green over there. And I was like blown away by the great, the great progress that has been made. If they need less fuel, then there's less uh, fuel supply lines and less convoys. Over 3,000 of our brave men and women have died in fuel convoys. And I met a lot of them that came home and who were luckily safe, were injured but safe from this fuel convoys. The naval base in Norfolk, Virginia. The water is rising and they now have to rebuild all of the piers. Well, you can't just move a naval base, obviously. So now they have to figure out what to do about that because they know what is to come with the rising sea levels. So there's all kinds of dangers, and they see that they really have to go green and they have to participate in this whole thing, which is another great, great thing that is happening worldwide that a lot of people don't know about and don't talk about.